problem how to cook a thick steak so that it's edible, okay? Without burning it and without it being cold on the inside, okay? That's the trick. We're gonna, that's, that's the mystery, okay? There's a other, couple of other kinds of, and, and, and by the way, I want to show you, um, give me just a minute, I've got pictures of the cow. Okay, let's see. Okay, I don't know if you can see this. All right, see that yellow piece right there? Chuck. That's our dear friend Chuck. What do you think the cow's doing all day long? <laughs> he, he's sticking his head down on the ground, eating the grass, pulling it up, working out that muscle. That is our hamburger meat. And it's also a chuck roast. It is tough as nails because it's strong as an ox, as a bull. Okay? <laughs> but that's what a chuck is. Chuck is tough. Ribs, tough. You've got to put it for a long time. Once you get towards the back, where the belly is, that's where the good stuff is. And then towards the rear end, it's the leg muscles. Okay? See the paint? They don't stink. But it's tough. I will show you an actual pop round rump, okay? Uh, 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 this is a beautiful piece of meat. It has no fat in it. You think there's fat in the buttocks, right? There is not. There is no, no fat. Now, this piece of meat is pure lean. It doesn't have the flavor that comes with fat. But it's really good if you like cooking chili, or if you want a roast that you have other sources of fat. It's, it's a great piece of meat, okay? But don't be fooled about its soft and tenderness. Okay, it will take at least six hours in the oven or in a crock pot. Okay, you put it in early morning Sunday, come back after five o'clock, and you got a great meal. Okay, you don't want to pass that around. You don't want to see it again. Yeah. Pass it around. This is that is round. That is. Round butt, okay? That's top round, and that's the pink part. Actually, the top half of the pink part. This here, it looks like a nice, thick steak. Huge, five pound steak. It's uh, $13 for this. And this is our dear friend Chuck, okay? Now, this is Chuck the way he's meant to be. Not that steak, that fraudulent steak, okay? This is a roast. I want y'all to pass this around. Look and notice the marbling of the fat. The fat, may, fat means flavor. That's what makes meat taste good, it's fat, okay? Uh, some people take fat and they inject it into the meat. It's not just to make it soft and tender, it does, but it is flavor. That's why historically people love the fat. Okay. Uh, yeah, and let's go ahead and pass these around here so, that, so they can see what a ribeye and a New York strip. The ground chuck is that ground round is the ground there. That's exactly right. And it just tells how lean it is. Okay. Now, the good stuff, uh, you heard of sirloin steaks. That's in the middle here. You ever heard of tenderloin? Who's ever heard of tenderloin? It is a piece of meat about this long. It is a long tubular piece of meat. And you can see it right there. It looks like that triangle. Can you see it on the picture? That is the tenderloin. That is what Chateaubriand is made out of. That is what filet mignon is. Okay? If you ever see something that says center cut, Chateaubriand, which is really something totally different, but people call it that. And filet mignon, that's what this is. You notice how small of a steak it is? It doesn't get any fatter than that. Nobody, nobody cut that down to size. That is the muscle. It's very long. It goes from the back leg all the way up to the ribs. I mean, from, from the butt to the ribs. About three feet long on a cow. And they just take it, do, 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 do. medallions, two inches thick, and 40 bucks a piece. 50 bucks a piece on the, at the menu, you know, at the restaurant. 
It's, it, it is the most tender piece of meat there is on the cow. It's never had it work out, even though the cow is full grown. He's never known how to exercise that muscle. And it's right there. And there it's going to be back. Wait, unless they're doing this with weights, which cows don't do. You know? It's, it's never been worked out. And so, um, if you look at it, I'm going to, pass, I'm going to look it around. You'll see some fat in there. So it has some flavor. Actually, it has quite a bit of flavor. It is not like a ribeye. If you pass that around, it's got fat marbled all through it. But it is, it is the, it's the king of meat, okay? Because it's so tender. You really don't even have to have a knife. It's that tender. You can cut it with your fork when it's cooked right. But usually, I cut it with a butter knife. Just for, can't, can't help myself. But, okay. I'll take a look at this over here, but don't, I'm, it's not fully prepared because we're going to finish it. I'm going to show you how to cook it. That is a filet mignon. And um, also they call it tenderloin. We call it tenderloin, filets of tenderloin. Same thing. It is the tenderloin. Right there. Diced up. And if you want to get technical about it, the filet mignon, what it really is, if they talk about if you want to get scientific about it, it is just that little tip there. And they just take it, and it's just a, a, one piece of filet mignon per cow. Oh. But they don't tell you that. They, they sell you the whole thing, and they cut it up into medallions, and they all call it filet mignon. But that is what it really is. If you talk to a French chef, he will tell you the difference. <laughs> okay. Now, how to prepare it. Another theory of good tasting meat, and this is a secret that they use in the restaurants, and they don't tell you at home, because they want you to go to the restaurant to eat the good stuff. There's a few things that they do at the restaurant that we don't do at home. And one is they prepare ahead of time. If you notice... I was scrambling this morning, running down the store, get the meat and all this kind of stuff. I was afraid that you guys were going to get here earlier. And I was nervous. Because it takes time. That's the key about meat. It takes time. Your meat cannot be cold. If it's cold, it's not going to cook right. It's going to be scratchy. Brown, gray. Eh. There's water and the condensation in there. It can't be warm. Uh, cold. It's got to be room temperature. So let it thaw out for a good hour. And another key, uh, secret uh, for... Um, when you say thaw out, you mean sit out? But you sit out. You just buy it fresh. And you buy it fresh, or if you have it in the refrigerator, I mean, it's got to be room temperature, one way or the other. They say thaw, you don't get it from frozen. Not from frozen. If you do have to freeze it, you better start a day ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's got to be... It needs to get out of the fridge and onto the counter for a good hour for it to, you know... It needs to be room temperature. The other thing is, it's got to be dry. Okay, that's why I have it, this one, in paper towels. It will not, the secret to cooking good meat, and this uh, is, uh, is good for basically all meat, whether it's cow, pig, bird, doesn't matter. Water and frying don't mix, okay? It just doesn't. It won't stick to the pan, and you want it to stick to the pan. Uh, it steams. You don't want your meat to steam. Not on the skillet. I mean, there are ways of cooking meat to steam it, but not, not this kind. Okay. You want it to be dry. You want it to stick to the pan. And you want it to... Oh, the, the real secret, uh, one of the big secrets is salt. Okay. So let me get... I'm going to take this bowl here, and I'm going to show you how they do it. What happened? Oh, here it is. Okay. I have salt in this thing here because the, to the chef, they never pour it from the box. They always do it from the thing. Because you notice that? Yes. So I'm going to do it that way because I want to look like the chef. <laughs> All right. So uh, what I do is I take the meat. It's been sitting out. Is it room temperature? It has been sitting out since about 8.30 this morning. And it is. Is it room temperature? Close enough. Okay. And it's very dry. I mean, you can see how you take paper towel, you soak up the blood and juice and all the stuff. It is sticky. Look how sticky that is. Oh, yeah. And you think, oh, no, that's bad. You like it to be wet. No, 
<laughs> you want it to be sticky. Look at that. Okay, so that, does that look like what you see in the elevator of a fancy hotel? Fancy, yeah. fancy hotel, they show you a, a filet mignon about that thick. And wow, well that's what this is, thick. Okay, so then they take a salt, and you don't, don't need heart conscious people, okay? Look at that, lots of salt. Okay, salt the heck out of it. Okay? It's going to get too salty though. That's what you think. It's not? Nobody ever sends their steak back to the chef saying it's too salty. <laughs> they never do. <laughs> <laughs> what they do is they send it, they, they send it back because it's too raw or it's overdone. Too bland. Too bland. Ooh, they don't like that. <laughs> it soaks in. That's why you need a good hour. Okay? So, I mean, it's, that's looks like a lot of salt, right? It's really not much. I've got two inches of meat here. So I'll just set that there, and I will set that. And you can do that early on when you're trying to get it to room temperature. Okay. But that is, I did this recently. It makes all the difference. It does. I tried it. So the last time I cooked this kind of meat, I said, okay, it's Mother's Day. I'm going to do it right. I got it early. I did the meat, salted it. An hour later, I came back, and um, so, and that's the case. your eyes roll back. <laughs> it did. Yeah. I just cut it open. I mean, wow, it was good. And so then I have, so what I did, just to save time, because I don't have an hour, this has been salted just like that one, wow. and this has been salted just like that one. Take a look at it closely. See if the salt melted. Think, see if you think it's soaking in. You think it's soaking wow. in? Oh, it's soaking yeah. in. Yeah. Look like it's soaking in. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Soaked in. And so this works with this uh, ribeye steak as well. And the ribeye tenderloin is very similar. Just ribeye has a lot of fat. A lot of people have a hard time with fat. And then some people, uh, but the tenderloin is more tender. What makes meat tough and tender? Y'all know? Besides the fact salt. that it's a strong muscle, or, I mean, chemically, you want to know, or biologically. Yeah. It is a fiber. There's a fiber in there. Collagen. Anybody ever hear of collagen? Yeah. Okay, well, it kind of holds their muscles together. And when you have strong muscles, you got a lot of collagen. And that, that's what tough is, is the collagen. You're, biking, you're trying to bite through all that collagen. It takes time to break down collagen. That's why when you have a pot roast with a rump, with a round or a shoulder, and after about six hours, that collagen is just denatured, it's it's just liquefied, and then you don't need a fork, you don't need a knife, you just pick it off, you pick up the bone and it just falls right out. There's no more collagen. That's what that's 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 the enemy of the steak, is the collagen. And you have to deal with it. With, with the tough meats, it's got lots, you've got to kill it with time and heat. Heat and time. Not T-H-Y-N-E. T-I-N-E. Time. Okay? Um, so, now, now you know how to prepare the meat. And we do have, after it's soaked for a good hour uh, with salt, you can, uh, at that point, it's okay to put pepper on it. And I, I usually... But not too much. Not too much, I mean, you gotta take a little. I like pepper. So, and I like it coarsely ground. So, I'll, I'll put pepper on there. I'm not gonna put it on the other one just because some people don't like it. Okay, and it looks very wet to me. So, I am going to, I'm gonna pat it dry. You're not liking the salt though? Mm, I'm not sure. But it was dry. I mean, it was wet. That's a problem. The salt does bring it out. Soak it in. But I put a lot of salt in it. So. Anyway. Now, let me show you how to cook it. Now, let me ask this. Thin steaks. Have y'all ever eaten at Cougar Eat or McDonald's? How thick is that meat? One tenth of a pound. I mean, it's tiny, thin. So, and it's done. Okay. Um, with something like this, if you fry it on one side and you flip it on the other side until it's nice, and who likes that crust? 
on the outside of the meat. Yeah. Yeah. We all love that. And that is the secret of good of good meat. You want to get that crust. What that crust is, is not caramel. You didn't caramelize the meat. Because caramelization is turning sugar into candy. And the meat doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. But you're doing something very similar to it. It's called a mallard reaction. Okay, think of the mallard duck. Okay, quack, quack. Okay, the mallard duck, you want a mallard, and I think it's M-A-L-L-I-A-R-D, I think. Anyway, it's a mallard reaction, and it, you think it's caramelizing the meat, and it's a good model. It'll work. You're making a crust, and it is a chemical reaction that happens at the meat and at the metal. Okay, it's hot, real hot. 450 to 500 degrees, sometimes even 750. I mean, it's real hot, okay? And you want to basically try to burn the meat, okay? You want to get it as hot as you can. I've, test, I've tried it, and uh, you can get your stove up to about 500, 550 degrees, and it's for me, it's a little hot, but 450 works beautifully. And I'll tell you how hot that is. I'm gonna turn this thing on. Now, this is a really cool, um, Stove top, it's called an induction. And the only reason I have it here is because I didn't think we would fit in there. And so I borrowed it from my daughter. But it's a special one. It, uh... Okay, watch. I can touch this. No harm. I can put this on there, and it gets hot. I can take it off, and it's still cold. Wow. This is the heating element. On a, on, that's, when you get to an induction stove, this is the heating element, not that. It uses magnets, and it makes this get hot, but this is not. Now, it might get hot, but only because it's touching this. This is, might be heating that up. So, kind of cool. Uh, it works on any pot that can hold a magnet. This one is aluminum. Doesn't work. Okay. But this is the latest technology in stove. It is really cool. Um, cool. Excuse the pun. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm going to set it to 450, maybe 500, it goes up to 450, that's hot enough. And I can feel it, and it gets hot extremely fast, it boils water extremely fast, because it doesn't go from the heating element to the pot to the water, it just goes from the pot, which is the heating element, to the water. And it, it'll boil your water at least twice as fast. Okay, so it's going to get hot, it's getting real hot, and uh, so I'll, I will put a little bit of oil. Now, some people say, I've tried it both ways. No oil or a little bit of oil. I think a little bit of oil is the best. Butter okay too? Butter will burn. Unless it's clarified butter. Which means you've already melted it and you've straight out all the like solids and the, all the, anything except for the pure yellow. Yeah, the cream. The, yeah, the milk solids will burn. So, um, Oh yeah, it's hot. Now, if you don't have a thermometer, now Elizabeth taught me about radiation thermometer, you know, little radar gun, and they'll tell you how hot it is. And that's how I know how hot these things are. And so, 450 degrees is perfect, I'm just telling you. How do you know it's 450 if you don't have one of those cool laser guns? Well, you just watch, see how it's starting to smoke? That's 450 degrees, just so you know. All right. Okay, so I'm going to put it on there. I'm going to take uh, this one and I'll just set it on there. Oh, you hear that mountain reaction? Quack, quack. Quack, quack. Yeah. <laughs> you really don't I thought it always had to be on a grill. I thought huh? you had to grill a steak on a grill. Oh, uh, this. And it's stuck. I can't pull it off. We well, to you can't pull it off if you pull very hard. Don't do it. Too much pepper. Don't pull it off. If it's stuck, it's supposed to be stuck until that malleable reaction is complete, and then it will. I'm done. You gotta release it, and then it's perfect. Wow. Cool. You never have to pry it off. Don't. No, you're just destroying it. You don't flip it over, Steve. Not yet. You wait till it's done. If it won't come off, leave it on. Now, I, of all things, I forgot. Uh, a fork. It's not burning? 
Oh, we have no. Peter, hurry, flip it, Stephen. It's it, burning. It finished. Oh. Look at that. Now, I will say, I'm not used to cooking on this kind of stove top, so sometimes it takes a little longer. If you cook with a cast iron, I'm going to flip it over. Look at that. Oh, now that's perfect. You see that? That's perfect. That's what you want. You're looking for anything you can do. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, it does. And I, I have to admit, I'm not accustomed to uh, cooking on this kind of stove top with my first time. Okay. Do you know how to cook it on a grill? Do you know how to what? Cook it on a grill outside? Uh, you still have the same laws of physics. I just, I just kind of done it. You just have to. Now, it's going to be done here shortly. And then you're going to look at it and you say, I won't eat that. Because it's raw. No. How many of you like it super rare? Yeah. Some people do. Okay, but most people no, most people like it around medium rare, which I will tell you is about 145 degrees on the inside. 150 maybe if you don't want very much pink. Okay, so I'm thinking that this is probably done. Oh, that just, there was no stickage. Look at that. So I'm going to set this right here. Did you get on the side too, or did you get to the one foot? Well, that's what I'm going to show you. Okay. All right. How many of y'all are excited about eating that as is? Huh? Two, huh? Huh? How many of you want to dive in? Too rare. Look at that. But how many of you like the outside crust? Okay, now this is some, this is a secret just for thick steaks, okay? Thin steaks, just do it on the grill. Thick steaks, this is the problem. Look at that. Okay? How does it look on the top? Perfect. It looks perfect on the top. It's bad on the middle. Okay? Now some people like it that way. But that's medium rare? No, this is rare. That is rare. That is rare. Okay? Very crazy rare. And uh, normally it would be. <sighs> okay, so what I'm going to do now, just so that we can have enough people to try out, I'm going to cook these other two. Okay, let me let me uh, cook these other two because what I'm going to do. <laughs> You may have any idea on how to finish it off? Put it in the oven. No. What do you think about all this? Stuff? That's what you do. Really? You absolutely do. I was being put it funny. In the oven. And that would put the inside. I was being funny. I was that being... is the secret that they do at the chef. That's how you. That's exactly what you do. Do they sear them ahead of time? And they oh, sear it, and then they put it in the oven, and they cook it. Um, I mean, they make it. The malate, the malate is it first. Uh, they get the malate reaction to get the crust on the outside. And since it's a thick steak, it's almost like a roast. You pop it in the oven, cook it to the inside until the inside hits the desired temperature. Medium rare, which is approximately 145, 147 ish. I mean, 145 to 150, depending on if you want a little more pink or almost no pink. At 150, it's almost no pink. At 160, well done. So how long and what temperature in the oven do you know? Um, around 350 degrees in the oven. But you want to give it a little bit of time so that the heat goes in the inside. Lower heat means more penetration. You don't want to burn it. So the myth about juicy steak has nothing to do with water. It has nothing to do with water. Juicy steak has nothing to do with this. You didn't even marinate. Wow. How long in the oven at 300 degrees? It may take uh, 15, 20 minutes. Now, the secret, how do you know? Yeah. How many of y'all seen one of these things? You can buy them at your grocery store, certainly at Bed Bath & Beyond. It's about 20 bucks. The meat thermometer, you stick it in the meat, put this in here, and put it in this cable, does not burn. 
is faith in me, and when that thing says the tip desired temperature, you're done. It's the coolest thing. Show me the temperature. When they say stick a fork in it, you're done. They meant to say that. Okay, hold on just a second. I want to make sure. Hundred and sixty is well done. There's no pink left at hundred and sixty. Hundred and forty. A little on the rare. Mm, yeah. Hundred and thirty five to hundred and forty is rare. Forty, fifty, sixty. Forty, fifty, sixty. Yeah. Fifty is borderline well done. I mean that's medium well. Medium well, yes. Okay, now I'm gonna take this out there. Yes. And I ah, forgot. Uh, no. I think we can have most of that. If you want to decorate it up, rosemary, just break it in half and put that and put the meat right on top of it. Uh, when you're done, or you cook it when you put it in the oven, put that on there. It makes it taste good. So when they put the butter on top that's in the oven? They let After it's done with the oven, they put a dollop of butter on top and it melts and soaks in. And that's the other secret that nobody tells you. But, but, lots and lots. So you don't of butter. marinate it. You don't cook it with you, butter. You just serve it with butter. Serve it with butter. You don't marinate it, right? You let the meat. Okay. So your secret spices are salt and pepper. That's it. That's and butter. I'm going to buy a chef and she you said You can put rosemary on it. I've never heard of it. No. Okay. And then, because it looks so good. Salt. Wow. Doesn't that look good? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do, uh, that's most of the talking, I'm going to uh, show you what I'm going to, I mean, I am going to put this in the oven, we are going to cook it for 300 uh, to uh, 150 degrees, 145 to 150, and then we're going to enjoy it, and I hope I'm not going to mess up the brunch. Okay, speaking of brunch, it is ready at this point. Oh, is it? Yeah. Bring that to the oven. I'll finish it up, I'll, I'll, that's, but that's the secret, I'm just going to put it in the oven, finish it up. I'm going to cook up this uh, New York strip and um, mm, have fun. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Do you Hey. Don't need to do that. And you don't marry it. That's good. Don't marinate it. Well, you can marinate it, but the flavor of the meat itself it. is. That's what you want. <laughs> okay, what about freezing? Take a look at that. Look at that crust. That's the last one I did. Is that is that a good amount of reaction? <laughs> Samuel! Samuel, how is it? That's okay. I need to get off. It's kind of raw. Wow, Stephen knocked out a little bit.
check this. So, now let me ask another question. How many of you have spent $50 or more on a steak? And did it make your eyes roll back in the back of your head? Yeah. How many of you want to learn how to do that? We're going to learn how to do that, okay? I don't want to take too long, though. Now, how many of you think that meat is meat is meat? Oh, huh? It's all come from the cow, doesn't This it? is Michael's. I think you've probably okay. seen this. It's Michael's. I'm going to show you. This is show and tell. And um, I hope everything works. All right? This is exhibit one. <laughs> How does this look? Whoa. Does it look good? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nice, marble, beautiful red meat. And it's sold at the grocery store for $8. Oh. Do you know why? Because there's a bunch of suckers out there that will buy it. <laughs> yes. This is glitter. <laughs> okay? They, they make hamburger meat out of this because you have to grind it up so it's soft enough to chew. Okay? It's leather. It is a, it's a, it's a sham. Okay? What's the name, what's the name of that meat? Okay? Sham. I'm going to tell you in a minute. Look at this one. Oh. All cut up for a steak. Delicious? Delicious. Or not? Friend or foe? Friend. <laughs> it looks delicious. Marbled, red, juicy, leather. <laughs> it's leather. It costs four and a half dollars. Don't be a sucker. There's lots of them out there. That's why they sell this. For cheap because they think, yes. And someone says, wow, look at that thing, four and a half dollars. I'm gonna get it. And they get it. And they can't eat it. Okay? They have a Bernie Tucker experience. Wow, that looks okay. like And I'll explain why some meats are different than others. Okay, what's the difference? Beef, chuck, shoulder, steak. Same beast. Now this. All right, look at that. Okay. Oh. What do you think this is? Friend. Friend or foe? Friend. Friend. What's the price Friend tag on it? Foe. What's the price tag? Eleven dollars. Yeah. Friend. Oh, Friend. Friend. Yeah. Friend. This is what you call a New York strip. Okay. Those are chuck. Okay. It says chuck, so you can chuck it. Okay. <laughs> Just think of it that way. Really. Chuck has its purpose in life, and it is delicious meat, but not when you cook it like a steak. Okay? You have to cook it for six hours. It's like brisket. You ever taste this brisket that was undercooked? Yes. It's lettuce. It just won't do. Okay, six hours, and I'll explain why. This, short-term cook, delicious. New York strip. <laughs> Yeah. Friend. Oh, this is friend. This is heavily marbled. Looks just like a chuck. But it is called ribeye. Oh. This is yeah. ribeye. Price tag? Fifteen sixteen dollars. Eight dollars a piece. So okay? worth it. So worth it. And that's way that's and that's bone in, you can see the bone. But what let me explain what the difference is between friend and foe, okay? What makes meat tough and tender? There's the cow, and just, have you ever heard of veal? Yes. Veal is very tender. Because what is veal? Baby. It's a baby. How many times have they plowed the field? Their muscles are weak. They've never been used. And truth of the matter is, in some of the factory farms, they take cows and they keep them pinned up to where they can't move, and so they never get a chance to work their muscles out. Strong muscles means tough meat. Weak muscles 
these tender meats. That's why we like to eat baby lamb. That's why we like to eat um, veal. That's why we like to eat the muscles on a cow that's never been worked out, such as the ribeye. And such as the king of meat, the filet mignon. Okay. That's what this is. And, and look how thick that is. It's about two inches thick. And so I'm going to cover another problem. How to cook a thick steak so that it's edible. Okay? Without burning it and without it being cold on the inside. Okay? That's the trick. We're going to touch that's the mystery. Okay? So there's a other, couple of other kinds. Of, and, and, and by the way, I want to show you. Um, give me just a minute. I've got pictures of the cows. Okay. Let's see. Okay. I don't know if you can see this. All right. See that yellow piece right there? Chuck. That's our dear friend Chuck. What do you think a cow's doing all day long? <laughs> he, he's sticking his head down on the ground, eating the grass, pulling it up, working out that muscle. That is our hamburger meat. That is also a chuck roast. It is tough as nails because it's strong as an ox, as a bull. Okay? <laughs> but that's what a truck is. Chuck is tough. Ribs, tough. You've got to cook those for a long time. Once you get towards the back, where the belly is, that's where the good stuff is. And then towards the rear end, so the leg muscles. Okay, see the paint? It don't stink, but it's tough. I will show you an actual top round rump. Okay? This is a beautiful piece of meat. It has no fat in it. You think there's fat in the buttocks, right? Yeah. There is not. There is no, no fat. Now, this piece of meat is pure lean. Doesn't have the flavor that comes with fat. But it's really good if you're like cooking chili or if you want to roast that you have other sources of fat. It's, it's a great piece of meat, okay? But don't be fooled about this soft tenderness. Okay? It will take at least six hours in the oven or in a crock pot, okay? You put it in early morning Sunday, Come back after five o'clock and you got a great meal. Okay? Y'all want to pass that around? Y'all want to see it? Or? Yeah. 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 Pass it around. This is around. that is round. That is round butt. Okay. It's top round, and that's the pink part. Actually, the top half of the pink part. This here is it looks like a nice thick steak, huge five pound steak. It's uh, thirteen dollars for this. And this is our dear friend Chuck, okay? Now this is Chuck the way he's meant to be, not that steak, that fraudulent steak, okay? <laughs> this is a roast. I want y'all to pass this around. Look and notice the marbling of the fat. Fat, mean, fat means flavor. That's what makes meat taste good, fat, okay? Uh, some people take fat and inject it into the meat. It's not just to make it soft and tender, it does but it is flavor. That's why historically people love the fat. Okay. Uh, yeah, and let's go ahead and pass these around here so, that, so they can see what a ribeye and a New York strip. That's exactly right. And it just tells how lean it is. Okay. Now, the good stuff uh, you heard of sirloin steaks? That's in the middle here. You ever heard of tenderloin? Who's ever heard of tenderloin? It is a piece of meat about this long. It is a long tubular piece of meat. And you can see it right there. It looks like that triangle. Can you see it on the picture? That is the tenderloin. That is what Chateaubriand is made out of. That is what filet mignon is. Okay, if you ever see something that says center cut, Chateaubriand, which is really something totally different, but people call it that. 
And filet mignon, that's what this is. And notice how small the steak it is. It doesn't get any fatter than that. Nobody, nobody cut that down to size. That is the muscle. And it's very long. It goes from the back leg all the way up to the ribs. I mean, from, from the butt to the ribs. About three feet long on a cow. And they just take it, doop, 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 doop. medallions, two inches thick, and 40 bucks a piece, 50 bucks a piece on the menu, you know, at the restaurant. It's, it, it is the most tender piece of meat <clears throat> there is on the cow. It's never had to work out, even though the cow is full grown, he's never known how to exercise that muscle. And it's just right there. Right there, it's on your back. I mean, unless they're doing this with weights, which cows don't do. <laughs> you know, they just, it's never been worked out. And so, um, I like floors. if you look at it, I like floors. I'm going to look it around. You'll see some fat in there. So it has some flavor. Actually, it has quite a bit of flavor. It is not like a ribeye. Which if you pass that around, it's got fat marbled all through it. But it is, it is the, it's the king of meat, okay? Because it's so tender. You really don't even have to have a knife. It's that tender. You can cut it with your fork when it's cooked right. Wow. But usually, I cut it with a butter knife. Just for me. Yeah. I can't help myself. <laughs> but, okay. Now I'll take a look at this over here, but don't, I'm, it's not fully prepared because we're going to finish it. Nice I'm going to show you how to cook it. That is a filet mignon. And um, also, they call it tenderloin. They call it tenderloin, filets of tenderloin. Same thing. It is the tenderloin right there, diced up. And if you want to get technical about it, the filet mignon, what it really is, if they talk about it, if you want to get scientific about it, it is just that little tip there. And they just take it, and it's just one piece of filet mignon per cow. But they don't tell you that. They, they sell you the whole thing, and they cut it up in the medallions, and they all call it filet mignon. But that is what it really is. If you talk to a French chef, yeah, he will tell you the difference. <laughs> okay. Now, how to prepare it. Another theory of good tasting meat, and this is a secret that they use in the restaurants. They don't tell you at home because they want you to go to the restaurant to eat the good stuff. There's a few things that they do at the restaurant that we don't do at home. And one is they prepare ahead of time. <laughs> if you notice, I was scrambling this morning, running down the store to get the meat and all this kind of stuff. I was afraid that you guys were going to get here earlier. And I was nervous because it takes time. That's the key about meat. It takes time. Your meat cannot be cold. If it's cold, it's not going to cook right. It's going to be splotchy, brown, gray. Mm. There's water and condensation in there. It can't be warm. A cold. It's got to be room temperature. So let it thaw out for a good hour. And another key, uh, secret uh, for um, when you say thaw out, you mean sit out. You sit out. Say, you just buy it fresh. And you buy it fresh, or if you have it in the refrigerator, I mean it's got to be room temperature. One way or the other. When you say thaw, you don't mean from frozen. Not from frozen. If you do have to freeze it, you better start a day ahead of time. Okay, but it's got to be. It needs to get out of the fridge and onto the counter for a good hour for it to, you know. Room temperature. It needs to be room temperature. The other thing That's is, it's got to be dry. <laughs> okay, I, I had it, this one, in paper towels. It will not, the secret to cooking good meat, and this uh, is, uh, is good for basically all meat, whether it's cow, pig, bird, doesn't matter. Water and frying don't mix. Okay? It just doesn't. It won't stick to the pan. And you want it to stick to the pan. Uh, it steams. You don't want your meat to steam. Not on the skillet. I mean, there are ways of cooking meat to steam it, but not, not this kind. Okay? You want it to be dry. You want it to stick to the pan. And you want it to... Oh, the, the real secret, uh, one of the big secrets is... Salt, okay? So let me get, I'm gonna take this bowl here and I'm gonna show you how they do it. Well, this is so what cool. Oh, here it is. I know. Okay, I have salt in this. This is super useful. <laughs> the chef 
They never pour it from the bottom. They mm. always do it from the chamber. You know <laughs> yes. So I'm going to do it that way because I want to look like the chef. <laughs> All right. So um, what I do is like dinner and a show. It's been sitting out. Is the room temperature? It has been sitting out since about and dry. 8 30 this morning. And it is. Is the room temperature close enough? And it's dry. And it's dry. And it's very dry. I mean, you can see how you take paper towel, you soak up the blood and juice and all the stuff. It is sticky. Look how sticky that is. Oh, yeah. And you think, oh, no, that's bad. Do you like it to be wet? No. You want it to be sticky. Look at that. Okay, so that, does that look like what you see in the elevator? of a fancy hotel, yes. fancy wanky hotel. They show you a, a filet mignon about that thick. And wow, well that's what this is, thick. Okay, so then they take the salt. And you don't, don't be heart conscious people, okay? Look at that, lots of salt. Okay, salt the heck out of it, okay? Is it gonna get too salty though? That's what you think. It's not? Nobody ever sends their steak back to the chef saying it's too salty. <laughs> they never do. Yeah! <laughs> what they do is they send it, they, they send it back to time it's too raw or overdone. Or too bland. Too bland. Ooh, they don't like that. <laughs> it soaks in. That's why you need a good hour. Okay. So, I mean, it's, that's looking like a lot of salt, right? It's really not much. Oh, we got two inches of meat here. So I'll just set that there, and I will set that. And you can do that early on when you're trying to get it to room temperature. So, but that is, I did this recently. It makes a oh, difference. It does. I tried it. So the last time I cooked this kind of meat, I said, okay, it's Mother's Day. I'm going to do it right. I got it early. I did the meat, salted it. An hour later, I came back. And um, so, and that's. And it, it did. I cut it open. I mean, wow. It was good. And so then I have, so what I did, just to save time, because I don't have an hour, this has been salted just like that one. Wow. Oh. Doesn't that look good? Think, yeah. See if you think it's soaking in. You think it's soaking in? Oh, oh. It's soaking in. Yeah. Look like it's soaking in. Oh, yeah. 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 And this works with this uh, ribeye steak as well. The ribeye tenderloins, they're very similar. Just ribeye has a lot of fat, and a lot of people have a hard time with fat. And then some people, but the tenderloin is more tender. What makes meat tough and tender? Y'all know? Besides the fact that it's a strong muscle, or I mean, chemically, you want to, or biologically, it is a fiber. There's a fiber in there. Collagen. Anybody ever hear of collagen? Yes. Okay, well, that kind of holds our muscles together. And when you have strong muscles, you got a lot of collagen. And that's that's what tough is. Is the collagen? You're biting. You're trying to bite through all that collagen. It takes time to break down collagen. That's why when you have a pot roast with a rump, with a round or a shoulder, and after about six hours, that collagen is just denatured. It's it's just liquefied, and then you don't need a fork, you don't need a knife. You just pick it out. You pick up the bone, and it just falls right out. And then no more collagen. That's what that's 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 the enemy of the steak is the collagen, and you have to deal with it. With with the tough meats, it's got lots. You got to kill it with time and heat, heat and time. Not T H Y M E, T I M E, time. Okay. okay. Um, so, now, now you know how to prepare the meat. And we do have, after it's soaked for a good hour uh, with salt, you can, uh, at that point, it's okay to put pepper on it. And I, I usually. But not too much. Not too much. And then you've got to take the lid You can over pepper. Uh -huh. I like pepper. So. And I like it coarsely ground. So I'll, I'll put pepper on there. I'm not going to put it on the other one just because some people don't like it. Okay. And it looks very wet. I'm going to like Stephen on that one. So I am going to, I'm going to pat it dry. You're not wiping the salt off? No, I'm trying not to. But it was dry. I mean, it was wet. That's the problem. The salt brings it out. The salt does bring it out. 
soak it in. But I put a lot of salt on it. So anyway, now let me show you how to cook it. Now let me ask this. Thin steaks, have y'all ever eaten at the Cougar Eat or McDonald's? How thick is that meat? Very thin. One tenth of a pound. I mean it's tiny, thin. So and it's done. Okay. Um, with something like this, if you fry it on one side and you flip it on the other side until it's nice and who likes that crust on the outside of the meat? Yeah. yeah. We all love that. And that is the secret of good of good meat. You want to get that crust. What that crust is, is not caramel. You didn't caramelize the meat because caramelization is turning sugar into candy and the meat doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. But you're doing something very similar to it. It's called a mallard reaction. Okay, oh. think of the mallard duck. Okay, quack, quack. Okay, the mallard duck, you want a mallard, I think it's M A L L I A R D, I think. Anyway, it's a mallard reaction and it, you think it's caramelizing the meat and it's a good model. It'll work. You're making a crust and it is a chemical reaction that happens at the meat and at the metal. Okay, it's hot, real hot. 450 to 500 degrees, sometimes even 750. I mean, it's real hot, okay? And you want to basically try to burn the meat, okay? You wanna get it as hot as you can. I've tested, I've tried it, and uh, you can get your stove up to about 500, 550 degrees, and it's, for me, it's a little hot, but 450 works beautifully. And I'll tell you how hot that is. I'm gonna turn this thing on now. This is a really cool, um, Stove top is called an induction. And the only reason I have it here is because I didn't think we'd fit in there. And so I borrowed it from my daughter, but it's a special one. Different it, um, Different okay, watch. I can touch this, no harm. I can put this on there and it gets hot. I can take it off and it's still cold. What? This is the heating element on a, on, that's when you get to an induction stove, this is the heating element, not that. It uses magnets, and it makes this get hot, but this is not. Now, it might get hot, but only because it's touching this. This is, might be heating that up, so kind of cool. Uh, it works on any pot that can hold a magnet. This one is aluminum. Costco. Doesn't work, okay? But this is the latest technology in stove. It is really cool. Um, cool, excuse the pun. Uh -huh. uh, but I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just set it to 450, maybe 500. It goes up to 450. That's hot enough, and I can feel it. It gets hot extremely fast. It boils water extremely fast because it doesn't go from the heating element to the pot to the water. It just goes from the pot, which is the heating element, to the water, and it'll, it'll boil your water at least twice as fast. Okay, so it's going to get hot. It's getting real hot, and uh, so I'll I'll put. A little bit of oil. Now, some people say, I've tried it both ways. No oil or a little bit of oil. I think a little bit of oil. Is okay. Is butter okay too? Butter will burn. Unless it's clarified butter. Which means you've already melted it and you've strained out all the, the solids and the, all the, anything except the pure yellow. The, dairy, the, the cream will burn. The, yeah, the milk solids will burn. So, um, yeah, I always oh, yeah, thought that was good. Okay. Now, if you don't have a thermometer, you know, Elizabeth taught me about radiation thermometer, you know, those radar gun, and they'll tell you how hot it is. And that's how I know how hot these things are. And so, 450 degrees is perfect, I'm just telling you. How do you know it's 450 if you don't have one of those cool laser guns? Well, you just watch, see how it's starting to smoke? That's 450 degrees. Just say that. All right. Okay, so I'm going to put it on there. I'm going to take uh, this one and I'll just set it on there. Ooh. Oh, you hear that, that mounted reaction? Quack, <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> You really don't like I thought it always had to be on a grill. I thought huh? you had to grill a steak on a grill. <laughs> oh, uh -uh. this. And it's stuck. I can't pull it off. Well, you can pull it up if you pull very hard. <laughs> no, 
don't do it. Don't pull it off. If it's stuck, it's supposed to be stuck until that mallard reaction is complete. And then it will, I'm done. And then it releases. And then it's perfect. Cool. We never have to pry it off. No, you're just destroying it. You don't flip it over, Steve. I get it. You wait till it's done. If it won't come off, leave it on. Now, I, of all things, I forgot. I never would have guessed. Um, a fork. It's not burning? We have a fork. You need to hurry and flip it, Stephen. It's it, burning. It finished. Oh, look at that. Now, I will say, I'm not used to cooking on this kind of stove top, so sometimes it takes a little longer. If you cook with a cast iron, I'm going to flip it over. Look at that. Oh, yeah. You don't cover it? Oh, now that's perfect. That's perfect. You see that? That's perfect. That's what you want. You're looking for anything you can do. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> and I, I have to admit, I'm not accustomed to uh, cooking on this kind of stove top. It's my first time. Okay. Do you know how to cook it on a grill? Do I know how to what? Cook it on a grill outside? Is it the same? Uh, you still have the same laws of physics. Mm -hmm. I just I haven't done it. Yeah. You just have to. Now, it's going to be done here shortly. And then you're going to look at it and you say, I don't eat that. <laughs> because it's raw. No. How many of you like it super rare? Yeah! <laughs> I really do. Okay, but most people don't. Most I actually do like it. Medium rare, which I will tell you is about 145 degrees on the inside. 150 maybe if you don't want very much pink. Okay, so I'm thinking that this is like probably it. done. What does that mean? Why that's so Red. fast? Oh, that just, there was no stickage. Look at that. Oh, man. So I'm going to set this right here. Do you put it on the side or do you just do the one foot? Well, that's what I'm going to show you. Okay. All right. So, Steve, how many of y'all are excited about this? Yes. That? Woo! Uh, it smells delicious. Two. Uh huh? Uh huh? How many of you want to dive in? Not yet. Too rare. Look at that. I want to. But how many of you like the outside crust? I do. Okay. Now, this is some, this is a secret just for thick steaks. Okay. Thin steaks, just do it on the grill. Thick steaks, this is the problem. Look at that. Okay? How does it look on the top? It looks perfect on the top. It's bad on the middle. Okay? It smells delicious. Now, some people like it that way. But. That's medium rare? No, that's rare. That is rare. That is rare. Okay? Very crazy rare. And uh, normally, it would be. <laughs> okay. So, what I'm going to do now, just so that we can have enough for people to try out, I'm going to cook these other two. Okay, let me, let me uh, cook these other two, because what we're going to do. Anybody have any idea on how to finish it off? No way. That's what you do. Really? You absolutely do. Why? You put it in the oven. Are you and that's serious? That's the inside. That is the secret <laughs> that they do at the chef. That's how they use. That's exactly what you do. They sear them ahead of time. They sear it and then they put it in the oven and they cook it. Um. What's the name? The mallard. The mallard. Now they get the mallard reaction to get the crust on the outside. And since it's a thick steak, it's almost like a roast. Pop it in the oven, cook it into the inside until the inside hits the desired temperature. Medium rare, which is approximately 145, 147 ish. Between 145 and 150, depending on if you want a little more pink or almost no pink. At 150, it's almost no pink. At 160, it's well done. So, how long and at what temperature in the oven, you know? Um, around 350 degrees in the oven. If you want to give it a little bit of time so that the heat goes in the inside. Lower heat means more penetration. You don't want to burn it. 
So the myth about juicy steak has nothing to do with water. Has nothing to do with water. Juicy steak has nothing to do with this. You didn't even marinate. Wow. How long in the oven at 300 degrees? It may take uh, 15, 20 minutes. Now, the secret, how do you know? How many of you have seen one of these things? You can buy them at your grocery store, certainly at Bed Bath & Beyond. It's about 20 bucks. It's a meat thermometer. You stick it in the meat, put this in here, and put it in this cable. does not burn. You stay the meat, and when that thing says the temp desired temperature, you're done. It's the coolest thing. Tell me the temperatures again for medium rare well, and well done. Okay, hold on just a second. I'm not sure. 45 degrees is rare. 150 is a little pink. And 160 is, is well done. There's no pink left at 160. 160 140. A little on the... Rare. Mm, yeah. 135 to 140 is rare. So 40, 50, 60. 40, 50, 60. Yeah. 140, 50. 50 is well done. Okay. I mean, medium well. Medium well, yes. Okay, now. It's that, I'm it's take that exact. I cannot, I'm surprised. Yes. And I. Ah, forgot. Oh. Uh, no. I think we can help. I was never What? If you want to decorate it up, the rosemary. Just break it in half. I'll call Robin. And put that and put the meat right on top of it. Breakfast will be. Uh, when you're done, you cook right it. Now. When you put it in the oven, put that on there. It makes it taste good. I'll ask you. When they put the butter on top that's in the oven, it after it's done with the oven, they put a the of out. butter on top and it melts and soaks in. And that's the other secret that nobody tells you. Yeah. But. Yeah. It's just one of you to report. I, was, I have a bunch of people are watching Stephen. Should I tell them that breakfast is served or 30 minutes? Your secret spices are salt and pepper. That's it. And butter. And butter. You can put rosemary on it. Okay. And then, because it looks so good. Wow. Doesn't that look good? Okay, I'm going to tell them. Okay. So, what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do. That's most of the talking. I'm gonna uh, show you what I'm gonna, I mean, I am gonna put this in the oven. We are gonna cook it to 300, uh, to uh, 150 degrees, 145, 150, and then we're gonna enjoy it, and I hope I'm not gonna mess up your brunch. Okay, speaking of brunch, it is ready at this point, just oh, barely. Yeah, in the next five minutes. That's what I'll do. I'll, I'll finish it up, I'll, I'll, that's, but that's the secret. I'm just gonna put it in the oven, finish it up. I'm gonna cook up this uh, New York strip, and uh, have fun. I want some meat. All right. Thank you, Stephen. No mercy on me, but Steve had the opposite problem. He couldn't hit me. Now this is nothing to boast about, because he tried real hard to hit me right there and just couldn't quite do it. Because back then, I was a cowboy, and I wore a big belt buckle. This is how I know I'm a cowboy since I was little. Because I was wearing, luckily, a big belt buckle. And he was kicking me in his barefoot. We were always barefoot. He was kicking me, kicking me, right in the middle. And every time he kicked me, boom, he would hit the belt buckle. And he would go, I remember he bent his knee up, and he would go, oh, <laughs> I said, go ahead, kick me again. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Boom! And he kicked me four or five times. Do you remember this? Great time. Okay, <laughs> three or five, four or five. He kicked me three times in the thought bubble. I can't believe it. He stood there like this, ready to take it. I was believing in the thought bubble. And it protected me. Let's <laughs> see. Later on, we made up the best friends ever since. So those are three, the three the things that had to do with stones and <laughs> Steve. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to tell a couple of stories about traveling with the I'm going to fit about five of the most memorable 
you can't believe it, like there's no way that really happened. How does that even happen? How are you guys alive? A couple of the most memorable Packer travel stories. First of all, one of the earliest ones I remember was traveling all the way to Miami, Florida. That's about a 17 hour ride in a station wagon. No seat belts, no air conditioner. We'd, it'd get hot, we'd all just stick our heads out the window. And uh, it, that does not look very fancy driving up to one of the most beautiful hotels in Miami. Going to a pageant where five of us girls were competing. Stan and Joy were just engaged. She traveled with us, bless her heart, where's Joy? And Joy was in a hotel room with, with about eight people per room. Walks, pots and pans on little travel portable um, burners, and lots of cans of ravioli. I've never eaten ravioli since 1987, because that's when this was. Because no more ravioli. Mom would be so proud whipping up that ravioli. Traveled all the way down there. As soon as we get to Miami Fountain Blue Hilton, we all wanted to get out of the car and go to hotel check-in, and Mom said, no, go straight to the pool. So we all ran straight to the pool, and that was our bath. That was the way we could, she said, I don't want anybody seeing this look this way. Because uh, we looked like a bunch of ragamuffins. But that's the way we traveled. No seat belts, no AirPods, no, no, uh, and nothing to entertain us. We'd just sit there and look at each other, and we would say, let's see how long I can stare at you before you laugh. Uh, let, let's, um, let's make up songs on the way. Let, oh, it was a lot of, she's touching me, it's sticky, all that kind of stuff. ABC game if, if you really were adventurous. Okay, so another story, we went to a church history site tour in the motorhome. We have more memories in that motorhome. It gave us more problems and more great memories than, than probably any other um, addition, financial addition to the family for entertainment. Well, the motorhome was probably uh, about 75% off because it worked only about 25% of the time. And so uh, Lynn McKee, who still works with us, fixed it up. There are a couple times we went to see how it was working and he was living in it. And a couple times we had to take him on vacation with us because we were afraid it would break down. Well, we went all the way to, Cal uh, to Colorado on Christmas time and we only crashed twice in it. I think Stan crashed it both times. One of them while I was in the front seat, co-pilot with him at 2 a.m. And I just remember trees heading my way. We tried to hit a stop sign, and he just kept going and kept going. And I remember going, uh-oh, I, I think branches are getting a little closer. And we were, you know, stuff like that. And a 27-foot motorhome. Yes, it was Colorado at Christmas time. Oh, I had my foot on the brake. He had his foot on the brake. Yeah, so that was the first time. And then we ran out of gas on Christmas morning at about 5 a.m. and we had 13 people or 14, 15 in, in the motorhome and uh, we didn't know what to do. It was Christmas morning, can't interrupt anybody, do we hitchhike, do we, what do we do? So we decided to stay asleep for a little bit longer until it was early enough to let people get through their Christmas and then go knock on a door and see if they could help us with gasoline. Only thing I remember was freezing cold, okay? No air, nothing. We were all in the motorhome laying like a bunch of sardines in the back, trying to stay warm. About 12 people laying in that back area where we turned it into a giant bed. And all I remember was laying there and we're like, okay, on the count of three, everybody flip. Because we were tired of laying this way. One, two, three. <laughs> like 12 of us back there. And it worked and we waited and they showed up and you had to have a lot of patience growing up in a family and traveling and being uncomfortable. Raise your hand if you went on that trip with Grandpa Bernie and Nana in the motorhome, where you too were stranded and stuck in New Mexico. Yes. Well, uh, a lot of what happened on those kind of trips is what happened on ours. And even Dad told me before, I said, Dad, can you do this? He said, oh yeah, I want it to be kind of uncomfortable a lot of the time. And I said, Dad, the air conditioner's not on. He said, oh, I know. I did that on purpose. I want it to be uncomfortable. All right, so it's because you learn things from being uncomfortable. Can't have it. When we got stranded in Tucumcari, New Mexico, this big old sign that said, Tucumcari tonight. Well, we believed in Tucumcari for two nights. because Always got stranded in Tucumcari, New Mexico. That was a halfway point to Utah. Um, one of the, the last two. We passed on the church history site tour, Jackson County, Missouri. We were off schedule because we missed the Statue of Liberty 
the last people to get on the ferry to go, we were the next ones. And dad and, Nancy, dad and mom were like, wait, 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 I got my children, we're, we've come all this way. They're like, sorry, it's, it's gone, you know, no more. We waited and waited, and waited. And then no mercy on us. So they couldn't stand to think that we missed that. So we drove, did our next air, came all the way back. Another, I think it cost us about six hours each way to come back the next day and do the Statue of Liberty. So we worked our way out of the top. Okay, keep the line going. Okay, that's great. And went down and so that put us behind schedule when we hit Jackson County, Missouri. And Dad wanted us to see where, uh, where it, the, the Savior it may appear there in, in Missouri when the second coming comes. Well, it was two o'clock in the morning and we were all asleep. And Dad says, wake up everybody, it's time to get out and, and see Jackson County. Yeah. And we said, Dad, it, it's, I can't say that. I Don't talk about it, don't talk about it. Just get out and look around. <laughs> so we were like, okay, well, but we can't really say, I know, I, don't discuss it. Don't talk about what you can't see. Just, just keep going, keep going, and, and it's pitch black. Few people had a very low grade uh, flashlight. We were all just all looking at each other like, don't talk about the obvious. It is two o'clock in the morning, and we are touring Adam on Dionne. We're supposed to be rubber. Can't discuss the fact that we can't see anything. But Dad and Mom were adamant that they wanted us to know we were there. Well, I remember looking at this memorial marker and holding my flash and, and then come in, come in, come in. Okay. And, and that's how committed they were to ensuring that we had these memories. I don't remember a single word that I read. I just remember I was there. And that's what they wanted to make sure that we did. Last one, motorhome in New York City. Raise your hand if you've ever been to New York City. New York, this is probably one of the best Packard stories ever. You have to know this one. We drive. You've been on Broadway Street, busy traffic, taxis honking. We took a motor home on Broadway Street in New York City. That, just Google up New York City, Times Square. We took a 27-foot motor home with a... And not just any motor home. No, no. This was so ghetto fabulous. This thing was so ugly. And wait for the good part. Then we had a, a dirt bike bungee corded with dollar, one dollar bungee cords to the grill of the motorhome. Uh, just get that visualization. A big old white motorhome, red stripes, with a motorcycle just plastered right in there on the grill. With a couple bungee cords you could cut with some children's scissors. And people would look and what is this? They could, be, everyone was talking on the streets, we'd go through traffic, talking about like, what is, what is, who is this? Is this a Brady Bunch? Well, someone actually flushed a red cup down the toilet. Well, what happens when you flush a red solo cup down the toilet on accident and nobody knows about it in a motorhome? Well, it becomes stinky. And, and, uh, Lincoln logs. And, uh, yeah, for a couple days, we didn't know what happened. We just knew it wouldn't work and it was very stinky. So now we're in New York City with a very stinky uh, motorhome passing through town with the grill on the front and with the U.S. congressman in with us as well. And then the motorhome breaks down. On... Broadway Street. I'm not making this up. You know, we, we didn't know what to do. We were kind of scared at this point because I'm, I'm thinking this is where people get killed. And so we're like, what, what do we do? Mom and Dad said, get out of the car and find the nearest church. <laughs> like the Mormon church? This is, there's no Mormon church down here. We'll find one. There's bound to be one. And we just, okay, got out and started walking. I'm like, God, you know our Mormon church is Mormons, what's that? Okay, so we got, we left about half of the men in the car, I don't even know who stayed. I just remember we found the Mormon church in a office building on about the 12th floor. Sat in the lobby and waited. There's some office building and sat there. Where's your family? Uh, fixing our motor home that's stranded on Times Square. So just visualize all that. How they got it fixed, I don't know. How did we find that place? I don't know. And the fact that mom and dad just... Make it happen. So, those stories are true and unbelievable, but uh, yes, it happened.
also, uh, I'm going to shift gears to a true, all these stories are true. I don't even need to tell you from here on that they're true. I'm not going to tell you the story if it's not true. Absolutely happened in the back pasture. We lived on a 32-acre farm, currently where the children, the, the children, uh, Chilton's lived when we were children. There was a silver barn that we called the dairy barn because it used to be a dairy barn full of cows. Then there was a hay barn because guess what? In that barn there was hay. And we played in the hay a lot. Behind the dairy barn was about a 10 acre tract of land. And sometimes Grandpa Bernie, he treated the, he, he, he's a lawyer and the people that he dealt with were not always the top of society. Sometimes they were the lowest part of society and he helped them get out of jail. I remember one time he was walking to the courthouse, he told me that a bar of soap, bam, landed right next to his feet and fell out of the sky. Tied to it was a note with a rubber band. And he said, what does that say? Come get me out of jail. He looked up the courthouse 13 stories high and there's somebody goes, hey, Bernie! I'm up here in the 13th floor, 14th floor. So he went up there and got that person out of jail. That was when he was an early lawyer. The only thing, the guy, he didn't have another quarter, he couldn't call his lawyer, so he waited for, because he knew exactly when Bernie, the attorney, was going to walk up the sidewalk and he took that bar of soap that was heavy enough to drop a note where he was going to land. And it worked. Now, these kinds of characters would come into our lives and sometimes they couldn't pay with cash or a check. They could only pay with wheelbarrows or three-wheelers that they had, which suddenly showed up in our front yard one time, this amazing contraption called a three-wheeler. But it wasn't just any three-wheeler. It had big balloon mud tires on the back that were this wide each. And this whole three-wheeler was probably four feet wide and it had chopper handlebars that went down to a skinny front tire. And you rode it like a motorcycle. <laughs> and kids, listen to me. Who's, when you want a motorcycle to go fast, listen guys, come over here and listen to about the motorcycle. I told you this story last night. You remember I told you this story last night? When you want it to go fast, you go like this with your right hand, you go, when you want it to go slow, you go back like this. Uncle David, who's my brother, just younger than me, was about six years old. And he thought he was, he's extremely smart, but on that day, he thought he understood more than he really did understand. He assured us all, I understand. I remember seeing him hold his hand up because we began to explain to him it was his turn to drive the three-wheeler motorcycle in that back pasture behind the dairy barn that was 10 acres. And we understood something about that motorcycle that he didn't, and that is that it didn't have a graduated accelerator. That means it didn't go a little bit faster and a little bit faster and a little bit faster. The more you turned it, it had off and full blast. And that was the difference between this and this. So it was, wouldn't go, it wouldn't go, it wouldn't go, and then boom, it went too fast. And we were trying to tell David that, hey, you need to be real careful. He held up his hand to nod his head like this. I understand, I understand, I understand. And he sat down, he, but unfortunately, he grabbed hold of the handlebars before he sat down. Now look what happens when you grab hold of the handlebars and you sit down. What happens to that right handle? Yeah, you turn on the accelerator, but he didn't understand that he was turning on the accelerator, so he went like this. <laughs> and I watched the thing tear out of the, just pop the wheelie, and he, everybody else was clinging to the motorcycle and just couldn't hold on to it. David's eyes became as big as fried eggs. <laughs> Six or seven years old, riding a three-wheeler motorbike, completely out of control, and he was at the mercy of who knows what. Who knows what? 
and he was headed straight for a barbed wire fence. He was smart enough to know that barbed wire fences hurt if you run into them. So he went, he turned it like this, still fully accelerating. The front wheel chopper turned its wheel like this and started digging into the ground, but still hit it straight because he turned it too quickly. That kind of thing, you'd have to turn it kind of slow. But he turned it, and finally, right before he hit the barbed wire fence, it went and hit it straight back the other way toward the other barbed wire fence that was across a 10 acre pasture. And he just took off the other way, he was going at about 30 or 40 miles an hour, I imagine. And there were big ant piles all around in those crawdad holes. So the big balloon tires in the back were going boom, 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 boom. I think I might have seen his feet fly up in the air a couple of times. He was hanging on for dear life to the accelerator and wouldn't let go of that full blast accelerator. So the tighter he held on, the more for sure he was not going to slow down. And he sped right by his father, screaming at him, David, slow down! <laughs> and right before he hit the barber fence, he went, dug into it and went, and headed back to the other barbed wire fence. The first back and forth he went from the barbed wire fence, almost hit it, getting a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. And we became panicked because this youngster is out of control. And I want you to think about the little metaphors that we have in life. There you are in your vehicle. You are like a, a spirit inside a body like Grandpa. And that body is out of control. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's anger. But it's completely controlling whatever's inside it. Precious cargo. And as it was heading for the barbed wire fence and headed for disaster, he kept trying. There his loving father was screaming to him, Let go! And finally David heard the voice from shouting down from above him, his father, saying, just let go. About the fifth time, and he threw his hands up in the air and grabbed hold of the seat and it bounced rather quickly to a stop, to a stop, and probably saved his life because he listened to his father. Now, Stan, it sounded suicidal to him to let go and get thrown off. It made no sense to him to let go of the only security that he had. The only thing that he could hang on to were the handlebars. He didn't make the connection. We need a little help over there. This is a, um, We just need a little bit of help over there. If you're related to any of those directly or indirectly. At least stop the fight. Okay. So, so uh, that's a good point. We. The only thing that he knew that he could hold on to was the very thing that was causing the problem. And to let go, he had to have faith, absolute faith in his father, blind faith in this case, do something that didn't even make sense. But because he believed, just let go and held on to his seat and hoped for the best. And here we are still today. Great story, Stan. Uh, so many parallels that you can draw from all of these stories. I'm going to tell you a, a couple of other funny ones, and we're supposed to have you here out by 11:20 because I've been told they are ready to pray at 11:30. So we have seven minutes left. You have another what? Give, give me ten minutes. Okay, ten. Well, I'll take six, and I'll give you the final four. How about that? Okay, see, that means that's selfless. I've been giving him three times to talk. I'm going to take him two, and I'm not saying a word about it. I'm going to talk to him. <laughs> I came from Dad. I don't even mind taking the last banana. I don't even mind being 
I, I'm not even going to say anything about it. I don't even mind taking the worst one. <laughs> not even going to draw it to attention. And never even complained about it. Never even said a word about it. <laughs> yeah, I really did. You know, and having... You make that word. Not profession. We all, uh, having dinner or uh, breakfast with the Packards, with all of us there, which by the way was a big, a big deal, uh, ensured that we had breakfast every morning after seminary, but really, if you saw cheaper by the dozen, it was like that, there would be a huge tray of biscuits, it would come bring the frying pan and literally go like this. All right, upside down, dump them on, and everybody would just reach and grab like we've never had a meal before. I promise you, pancakes. <laughs> Everybody catch, catch, okay? Fr pancakes, French toast, thrown out like frisbees. I remember the, when we had L. Tom Perry come to our house, one of the 12 apostles, and we had dinner on glass plates. Now, none of them matched, but we had glass plates. And then we had, oh, excuse me, it was breakfast. So he got in late at night. Remember, we had clam chowder late. I was 12 years old, 13 years old. The morning we had breakfast, and we had orange juice and matching glasses. Too. Not, not matching glasses, but glasses. And I remember when we all sat down, we went, ooh, glass, plates. And Mom was like, shh, give it away. You have authority in the house. And I had never had a steak uh, at Franklin. I think there were 12 for a dollar. And my friend told me later, she goes, we had steak at your house, and we just kept chewing it, and chewing it, and it just kept growing, and growing, and, and I, I said, we did have steak, and then I thought it was the first time we ever had steak. Didn't have steak, didn't have roast meat, we never knew the words takeout, we didn't do takeout, because, now we would get banana pudding from a takeout place, but we still had to make the real meal. We didn't go out to eat, but very, very often at all, either. Golden Corral, maybe. Um, I can eat. And ponchos. Oh, yeah. So be this. So, all right. One of the best stories ever. Can't believe it's true. Even Dad tries to deny it. It's true. <laughs> Dad's like, I'm not sure that happened. Yes, he did. Dad drove the boys to seminary. Now, y'all know where we're going with this. Dad drove the boys to seminary. Who does not know where I'm going with this story? Raise your hand if you don't know this story. Couple, of, yes, this is good. It's truly unbelievable. I don't know what happened. The lapse in judgment. Well, we live very close to seminary, near the church house. Ooh, I'm having a hard time here, as Dad would say. <laughs> okay, so we have seminary. Well, Dad lived very close to them, and sometimes at night you may not sleep in your pajamas, just your underclothing. And that was one of those nights. Well, Dad woke up, considered we live a half a mile away from the church house or less. Drove the boys to seminary. By the way, his garments were very old. Oh, they were very old. Okay. Not the holy garments. <laughs> the holy priest said, look at me. Dad ran out of gas on the way back from the church house, which you could drive through the four wheeler. We walked home from church, so it's so close. Like, how, how do you let the gas tank get so low so many times? I don't know. You hear how many times I say we ran out of gas? Moral of the story. Keep your gas tank filled a little bit more often than we did. Because you never know when you might be driving your children to seminary in your garments. Well, Dad ran out of gas. And it's 5.30 in the morning. What are you going to do? So what do you do? You go hide behind every tree you can see. You wait for the cars. Now, try not to visualize this, but actually try to visualize it. You stand there, and you wait, and then you sprint to the next tree. And you hide, and you wait. And in these long oak trees, you're like this, and you run. You sprint, you're like, I can just get to Stevenson Road. I'm good. I'm good. Takes that one last sprint. I think some of the hiding places were actually in the ditch, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. yes. There was trees in the low part of the ditch. Then we get this. I think I saw President Packard running in the dark. Carmen's in this morning in the grass. What? 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 Yeah, once he, I think he thought he was safe once he hit Stevenson Road, and that might have been where he got busted, was turning that corner from 105 to Stevenson. And so, uh, moral of the story is, make sure you wear some pajamas. I deny the whole story. <laughs> I deny the whole story. I deny all of it. That's one of the best stories I've ever heard. Another great story. 
Uh, we should probably have been thrown in jail as siblings and, and dad and mom several times over for some of the things that we did. Uh, like leave your child at, at the store for two hours and not know it. Yes, we're on a family vacation in New Mexico on the way to Utah. Or maybe we're in Colorado. We're in the motorhome and I remember going, Mom, Dad, Santa won't come out of his hiding place. We're playing hide and seek and he won't come out. He's been hiding for a long time. Santa <laughs> will come out of your hiding place. Dad's traveling. Dad, he won't come And you did not disobey Dad. So we were alarmed once he did not disobey Dad. I didn't think he was disobeying. I knew he was gone. <laughs> Samuel, I said, come on out of your hiding place. Nobody I'm like, hmm. I don't think he's here. Samuel, this is your last warning. <laughs> no Samuel. So then we were, where, where did we go last? Where were we? Kmart in Colorado. <laughs> no cell phones. We didn't know where the Kmart was. We, we were figuring, oh my gosh, we're an hour and a half past Kmart. So how do you get an hour and a half down the road without realizing you lost one? We don't want to go there. But we pulled over to a gas station, found a pay phone, called the Kmart. Yeah, we're so sorry. We are missing nine-year-old boy running around here. Yeah, his name is Samuel Packard. Oh yeah, he's here. He's doing just fine. He's doing fine. Make friends with everybody. We'll have him here waiting for you. They did not say we're calling social service. That's just the way it was. We drive all the way back and Samuel's like, hey. Like, Samuel, I'm so sorry. He goes, no problem. I'm telling you, that's the way Samuel is. No problem, I knew y'all were going to come back. <laughs> said, Samuel, where are you afraid? Oh no, I'd already gone back behind the building. I piled myself up some leaves and I made myself a pallet before I was going to sleep tonight. <laughs> I guess y'all didn't come back until tomorrow. <laughs> How old? I don't, I don't know. It was very young. Give or take it two years. It was where many people were very scared for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know they left me, but it's going to be okay. They do that all the time. <laughs> we, we implemented the buddy system. After after 13 kids, we thought, we should probably like do the buddy system. Okay. And, uh, well, then, I probably... I think I was under eight, though. I do think I was under eight. Okay. So that was slightly unsupervised. Last story, and then I'll just let you have the last few minutes, Dan. Uh, I have a quick enough for you. Yes, yes. We're eight minutes till, the, yeah, till prayer. This one I'll keep fast, and I'll let you go ask him about it. Because I don't know all the details. I just know Dan should be in, have been in jail probably 20 times. <laughs> we all know that. They say Stan, who knows what he that is Dan. But Dan got away with it every time. Now, the things my teenage brothers used to do for fun entertainment, like set the freeway on fire, you know, those kinds of things. Um, you know, we screw it with, yes, that's not made up. Gasoline on the road, throw a lot over. Let's see what they'll do. Yeah. That happened. Nowadays, you get thrown in jail for it. For a long time. Well, this one probably goes down, and now I don't want to make light of it because, um, you know, nowadays, school shootings and things like that. We didn't have school shootings, so what this act was was like a pure prank. But it, but nowadays you would never do a prank like this because it's too sensitive and, and again, you would be put in prison for the rest of your life probably. But Dan, Will Franklin, and a couple other guys decided it would be fun to uh, hold his teachers and classrooms up hostage with what looked like a machine gun, but it's really a water gun. Wouldn't that be so fun to go into the school with ski masks on and pretend that you got a gun, but it's just a water gun? So, so they did it. Like, That's a great idea. They put pantyhose on their face, and if you want to know what that looks like, go try that. It looks really funny. If you pull the pantyhose down and rip it all the way back, you won't know what you And then and ski masks that they cut out their eyes. I'm sure Dad and Mom did not know about this plan. They got to school early, this before school starts. They run into the school. Get on the ground! Uh, well, see, now we gasped, and now when we were younger, we were like, really? What'd they do? Get on the ground, students, to his teacher. All right, and he soaked them down with water. And they screamed and laughed. Dan takes off running. Got her high school. This is 
true. Right out of high school. There's a getaway car and everything. I think Will Franklin is in the getaway car. They get out, change clothes and everything. See, that's how we treated it. They, they, they were honored. They were, they were uh, put on this pedestal for the pranks they would do. We're not even talking about the smoke, smoke bombs out at, at scout camp that evacuated the whole area either. But <laughs> you can ask him. Uh, so then Dan comes back. And they make it in the classroom, and they're like, Dan, you missed it! What happened? <laughs> Some guy came in, a group of people came in, trying to kill us, and there was water guns. Are you kidding me? What'd you do? How'd y'all do it? No, no one ever knew. <laughs> that is a true story. I, I don't even think very much of it's embellished. I think that's about 95% true. <laughs> you can ask him about the other 5%. Okay? Okay, uh, just I have a couple of boring announcements. Uh, we're gonna do this before Stan, because Stan's got a, a good story, so we'll end off with a bang here. They're wanting us to eat here in a little bit, so at 11.30ish, which is in about five, 10 minutes, we wanna just head over there as fast as possible, the food is ready. Okay, after the food, we have basically free time until we eat dinner. So during that free time, some people wanted to have some tournaments. So there's three tournaments, and Brandon, is he here? No. Okay, so Brandon is in charge, Brandon and Derek is in charge of Make a Million Tournament. That's gonna be over there at the other lodge. So Make a Million Tournament, if you've already signed up for that, just, that's uh, gonna be going on. Brayden is not here, but Brayden wanted to be in charge of something. And he knows, he says he knows the most about Warcraft 3. So you just wanna say, hey Brayden, if you are interested in Warcraft 3, talk to Brayden and just let him know how awesome he is. <laughs> and the last one is, well there's really two more. So kind of the last one is, if there's a child competition that still may or may not be going on in this very room. And I think Emmeline could be doing it. It's little games with little kids, 10 and under, that are doing little races and things like that. So that may still be going on. Uh, the last thing is David is doing this fireside tonight and he's asked some people to sing. Lisi, has he asked you? I think you're on the list. So if you are one of Bernie's grandchildren, you're probably on the list, about 50% chance you're on the list. It's usually one or two kids per family. Go talk to David, not this one, but the other, older David, and just say, hey, when do we practice? So sometime in this free time between noon and 5.30, we're hoping to play Make a Million, uh, Warcraft 3, and choir practice, and maybe some kid uh, stuff. Okay, so Stan, I'll turn it over to you. As, as you, um, heard earlier today and yesterday also my mother instilled in us an, an exaggerated self-confidence because she believed that it was all about self-confidence that created greatness and this is a little bit embarrassing but we grew up believing that we were better than perhaps we really were and we were just being nice to include everybody else. <laughs> we were being benevolent and because we wanted everybody else to live happy lives as well, but we really all knew how it was. Okay. <laughs> then when we got into college, we realized a shocking reality that <clears throat> there's other people that are smarter than us <laughs> and they can sing better than us and run faster than us in every category and we were just a little bit but <clears throat> um, I had a way to tie this in. Let me just, okay, that's just a little thing about mom and something that, that we had a big epiphany in life that we're way more normal than we wanted to realize. And we had to go through the same thing everybody else goes through and that was an epiphany. Okay, now, real quick, I was younger than I can remember and mom, Oh, now another connection. Okay, mom, really, they felt very proud of their motorhome with the motorcycle strapped to the front with bungee cords. And before even that, it was a station wagon that had the racks and, and it was an old station wagon, perhaps. And they were so proud of their station wagon that as they loaded up their children and began to drive away, they noticed that everybody pointing at their station wagon and they said, yeah. <laughs> they were pointing at the station wagon 
and they were particularly pointing to the top of the station wagon where the luggage rack was, and they were accepting compliments about the station wagon because they had this, we got it from mom. Mom had this incredible self-esteem too. <laughs> Until suddenly she said, where's baby Stan? Oh, he's on the top of the car still. And she got out and I was like, David was on the three-wheeler. Except I was only one and a half years old. Maybe less, maybe one. I was holding on to the luggage rack. <laughs> So, two things. That's how I learned about mom's self-esteem about paying for the station on my nose and my nose and my nose. And it's also how I learned from a very early age how to enjoy a life full of thrill ride. Yes. Where were you driving? I was going anywhere. I had a ticket to anywhere. I was just old enough. I don't know where they were or nor where they were going. I was a year old at the time, but I haven't heard of them. Is that it's a good question? Though. Now I want to shift over to we talked a little bit about Dan and how mischievous he was. I want to tell you my experience with Dan, and I had a lot of mischievous ones I could tell. I would love to tell, but I'm not going to. I'm going to tell a different story. We're going to end on this. <clears throat> Dan and I were exploring, and literally we went walking in the woods. We had woods, we have a setting, the perfect setting for childhood. We had a big farm, a big field that you could tear up a three-wheeler in. Or we had woods that you could explore. We had a pond in the back that had snakes and critters. And Dan and I were very good friends. And he was catching up with me in height. He, he, he grew faster than I. He started after I did, but he, anyway. <clears throat> But this is still, he was, I was taller, I, I was three, or three years older. We went to the pond and we saw a snake, literally that had a fish in his mouth. And the fish became petrified because we killed the snake and the fish, you could hold it, it was like holding a piece of cardboard. It was rigid. We saw spiders span from this tree to this tree and they were sitting in the middle going, <laughs> Come on. Right? And we just imagine the fangs on the spider going. <laughs> Don't touch the spider, it's just a spider, we go on. And we began to search for a fruit that's indigenous to the woods of southeast Texas called Mayhaws. Yeah. Have any of you ever heard of Mayhaw jelly? Yeah. Do you know what Mayhaws are? No. Yeah. There's these little tart berries that are not too good to eat, but they're perfect to make a nice tart jelly if you add enough sugar to it. It's the best jelly in the world. And these mayhaw trees grow in swampy areas, usually literally covered in water, two or three inches of water, definitely muddy, muddy water. And they have thorns, and we were barefoot, but we somehow became okay with walking up to the mayhaws and stepping onto the thorns because we wanted the fruit so bad. <clears throat> and we entered the woods. And yes, there's parallel. <clears throat> Listen closely to what I'm saying. Two young innocent boys entering from the open field where vision is clear into the woods where the swamps are, the snakes literally are, the spiders going. <laughs> and we're avoiding all the critters and we're going for the fruit of the mayhaw. It's so sweet. And we would grab the mayhaw trees and I remember spreading blankets on the ground, well, mainly where it was muddy, not watery. And we'd shake the mayhaw trees, the fruit would fall down and we'd pull up the blankets and dump the mayhaws into a bucket. And we'd carry the bucket to the next tree, which is over there. Shake the tree, gather the mayhaws, pour it in the bucket, and another tree over there, and another one, and another one. And we got deeper and deeper into the woods and we exceeded the depth that I'd ever been before. I'm not even sure they were our woods anymore. And probably because I remember crossing a barbed bar fence deep, a rusty one, and it might have been somebody. The mayhaw trees kept growing. They don't know where barbed bar fences are. <laughs> and we found so many mayhaw trees that led us deep into the woods, and we got carried away, and we couldn't find our way back. We were lost in the woods. Two young boys, probably, he was five or six. I might have been nine or ten. 
I was about nine, he was probably six. <clears throat> we searched for about an hour. I don't know if we got deeper in the woods or more shallow woods because all those mayhaw trees start to look alike and they're all swampy grounds and all the spiders looked alike. And we didn't see any snakes, but I'm for sure I heard them going. <laughs> <laughs> and then the sun started going down. And it started getting dusk, which means a little bit dark. And all of a sudden, I felt like my brother Steve. <laughs> and I began to worry because I heard that after the sun goes down, more snakes come. And you can't see if you're walking into a spider that's waiting for you because you can't see. And we would have to stay there and the mosquitoes come out at night and bite you. And there's so many things that harm you in the dark when you're in the woods and you're stuck and you can't get out. And I literally remember this. I asked my brother Dan, what do we do? And he said, we're going to pray. And I said, Good idea. And there was a nearby pine tree, and for some reason he knelt on one side and I knelt on the other side, 180 degrees, maybe so we didn't have to look at each other while we prayed. But their two brothers sat. And we prayed to be delivered, in our own childish words, from the woods that held us bound from the critters that were certainly coming at us, but all we could say is just help us find our way out of the woods. And it wasn't dark yet, but it would have been within 20 minutes. We prayed as sincerely as we knew how to pray to get out of the woods. We asked our Father in Heaven for help. And as we stood up, I promise you, our dog, Sheppy, who remembers Sheppy, mm -hmm. showed up. Never been so happy to see a dog. Dogs know their way home. So Dan jumped up and said, Sheppy! Sheppy's going to lead us home. God sent us Sheppy. <laughs> <laughs> and we followed Sheppy, and within 10 minutes, we were hearing the horn honking. What horn? Mom had driven the station wagon. We always had a station wagon. This was a different one. Up to the edge of the woods to the pasture, and honking the horn saying, Stan, Dan, I'm over here. And we were so deep in the woods we couldn't hear our mother calling for us. But as we kept following the God sent dog, we got closer to out of the woods of what held us bound. We could then hear our parents calling for us. And we got closer and closer and pretty soon we were out of the woods and it's open pasture and in the arms of my mother. And then we watched the sun go down as we drove home in the station wagon. And I'll let you figure it out what all that means. And so, thank you for listening to us. Let's go eat some food. They already said prayer and they're already eating, so we're the second way, so this is perfect. And finally, Right before you hit the rubber fence and went and hit straight back the other way toward the other barbed wire fence that was across a 10 acre pasture. And he just took off the other way and he's going about 30 or 40 miles an hour, I imagine. And there were big ant piles all around in those crawling holes. So the big balloon tires in the back were going boom, 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 boom. I think I might have seen his feet fly up in the air a couple of times. He was hanging on for dear life to the accelerator and wouldn't let go of that whole last accelerator. So the tighter he held on, the more for sure he was not going to slow down. And he sped right by his father, screaming at him, David, slow down. Ooh. And right before he hit the barber fence, he went, Dug into it and went. Mm. And headed back to the other barbed wire fence. But first, back and forth he went. And the barbed wire fence almost hitting it and getting a little closer and a little closer and a little closer.
closer and we begin to panic because this youngster is out of control. And I want you to think about the little metaphors that we have in life. There you are in your vehicle. You are like a, a spirit inside a body, like Grandpa. And that body is out of control. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's anger. But it's completely controlling whatever's inside it. Precious cargo. And as it was heading for the barbar fence and headed for disaster and he kept trying, there his loving father was screaming to him, let go! And we had orange juice and matching glasses. No, I'm not matching glasses, but glasses. And I remember when we all sat down and we went, ooh, glass, plates! And we all were like, shh, give it away! She had 30 in the house. All right. All right. And I had never had a steak. Uh, my friend came up and picked up for a dollar. And my friend told me that she just can't stay here. Daddy, watch and he just kept chewing it. Daddy, and it and just kept growing Daddy, and growing. And, and, and I, I said, we didn't have steak. I didn't know the first time we had steak. We had steak in our first place. We never knew it was takeout. We didn't take out. Okay. Now, we went to get banana pudding from a takeout place. But we still had to make it real good. We didn't go out to eat but very, very often at all. We had golden brown babies. Uh, okay, I can eat and function. So, yes. so, all right, one of the best stories yeah. ever. Can't believe it's true. Even dad tries to deny it. It's true. Dad's like, I'm not sure that happened. Yes. Dad drove the boys to seminary. Now, mom and I were all gone. Dad drove the boys to seminary. Who does not know where I'm going with this story? Raise your hand if you don't know this story. Yes. Daddy. Yes. Daddy. It's truly unbelievable. I don't know what happened. Lapse in judgment. Very close to. Ooh. By the end of the summer. Yeah. So I'm going to leave you with this before I leave on my mission, and I'll finish this up. But right now, this is Packard Video Locator, and what it does is it goes to the Packard Legacy channel, and it looks at all the videos in there. And whether it's from another channel, Michael found a way that you can sign into your channel on your YouTube channel and add to the Packard Legacy, and uh, and basically be able to search. It goes through each of those, each of the playlists, each of the videos, and grabs all the subtitles. And so you can search. The subtitles are basically a transcript. Yeah. So I know that we only have like a few videos indexed on here. So I know my brother Wyatt shows up in here. It's a little weird typing sideways. But, so what it. is that? What yes, is that? Why? Carson, look at me. Are you getting 